we're going to look, as I said before, at this speech that Barack Obama gives at the Democratic National Convention in Boston. But just to give you some context for when he gave this, he gave this as a state senator. He wasn't reporting every day to Washington, D.C. He was reporting every day to Springfield, Illinois, which is a beautiful place, but it wasn't as if this was a sort of superstar politician. And so he gives this speech, and then he writes this book, Dreams for My Father, and then he gives some more speeches, including one at the National Constitution Center called The More Perfect Union that we're going to look at a little bit more closely. And he essentially gets to the White House. In some ways, we could sort of frame it in this. Mr. Black, read it. In a sense, Barack Obama wrote his way to the White House. Right. He's writing his speeches. He's writing his books. He's really creating a sense of identity just through words. And so it's something that I stress with all the students I teach or interact with. And it's this phrase, Mr. Marco. Writing is a superpower. Yeah, it is. It was for Barack Obama. He wrote his way to the White House. Another way to frame this is this. It probably helps to be better with words than the other side. And so we can look at the campaign that he ran against John McCain, where his slogan was change we can believe in, and also yes we can, which got a lot of people motivated, sold a lot of t-shirts. Do you remember John McCain's campaign slogan during 2008? Country first. <laughs> Doesn't quite have the same sort of ring to it. Or think about another campaign. So in 1980, Ronald Reagan was squaring off against Jimmy Carter. And right before, sort of like right in the middle of election season, in July of 1979, Jimmy Carter gave what is called now the malaise speech. Now, he never actually said the word malaise in this speech, but he talked about the crisis of confidence that was going on in the country. And although there was a sort of immediate good reaction to the speech, it really hurt him in the long run because he was talking about things that were actually going on, which was the gas crisis, and people lining up for gas, a decrease in productivity, a decrease in voter turnout. But he seemed, at least to a big chunk of the population, as a real downer, like he was lecturing the American people. And he led in, he, or he sort of opened himself up to this comment by Reagan, I think the week before the election, Mr. Nuxall. You want to read it for us? Are you better off than you were four years ago? Yeah, so this is what Reagan asked the country right before the election. And it really seemed to capture the situation of how Americans were feeling. Of No, I'm not better off than I was four years ago. Maybe I need a change. And so in the election, Reagan killed Carter, not just because of this speech, but there was a sense that this guy is a better communicator than was Carter. Carter got Georgia and maybe one or two other states. But Reagan really seemed to capture the nation, just as he did four years later when he's going against Walter Mondale. So here, we have a much different situation, right? So now we have an economy that's booming. We have a stock market that's booming. Technology's starting to take off. Apple introduces the Macintosh, which actually looked like that. Uh, that's the Macintosh. It greeted you with a nice hello. And so Reagan didn't say, look, are you better off? than you were four years ago, Mr. Marco, his campaign slogan was? It's morning again in America. Yeah, why is morning a great campaign slogan to sort of create optimism? It's like new beginnings and like fresh start. Yeah, it's not an accident that you choose that language. Similar to what Maya Angelou does when she reads a poem in the inauguration of Bill Clinton another kind of new beginning. She takes up this theme of maybe mourning is a powerful way to communicate to a bunch of people. So she calls her poem on the pulse of the morning, and I'll just read to you the ending. Here on the pulse of this new day, you may have the grace to look up and out and into your sister's eyes, into your brother's face, your country, and say simply, very simply, with hope, good morning. Right? We use these examples so we can start to see how people who use words really, really well do it when they're 
faced with an audience. So potentially we can borrow some of their tricks, some of their tools when we're faced with an audience. And if we're talking about sort of like the advantage of being better at words than other folks, we can definitely have this principle, Miss DeMarco. Nobody is better with words than Maya Angelou. Yeah, so figure out how she writes her autobiographies, figure out how she writes her poetry, and see if you can borrow some of the tools and put them into your legal writing.